very good morning to you. What a fantastic crowd we have today. Ladies and gentlemen, special guests, I'm delighted to be with you today. My name is Eleni Jokas. I'm a correspondent at CNN International, and we're here to talk about the most incredible stories coming from uh, our fabulous panel this morning. It's about building transformational organizations that are going to have a big impact on the continent and the world, building leaders that can shape Africa and impact the world. Africa in the next 20 years, how are you going to be part of that economic growth story and the changes that will happen in Africa? I want us uh, to introduce our panel and then I want you to think about uh, some of the big issues that we're going to be covering today. We're going to get this very interactive. We want to hear your stories. We want to hear your questions. So start jotting them down. I'm sure you already have quite a few for our incredible guests this morning. Uh, Aliko Dangote, founder and... Uh, Chief Executive of the Dangote Group, uh, cement, flour, I mean, we can, we, the list basically goes on, oil, and of course, an incredible foundation, uh, the first and the largest foundation uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, focusing on education, nutrition, uh, and the betterment of Nigerian lives. So we're so proud to have you here with us uh, today. And of course, Forbes has listed him as one of the most powerful people in the world. And we also have to say, of course, the richest man in Africa, although it's not about what's in your bank account, it's about the impact that you make. Trevor Manuel, so what a pleasure to have you with us this morning, the chairman of Old Mutual. Um, he served as cabinet minister, uh, ministers uh, under the Nelson Mandela uh, um, presidency. He was the first finance minister in a new democratic South Africa. He is the man that was able to bring a budget surplus in the country, and he also ensured South Africa did not fall into a debt trap after those crippling sanctions uh, during the apartheid era. And then John Collison, he is the co-founder and president of Stripe. He is the real global self-made millionaire in the world, the real guy, right? I'm sure you've seen on your Twitter feed that there's someone else in the running. Um, building an online payment system, uh, expanding uh, internet commerce uh, by making it easy to process transactions. Uh, started this uh, business with his uh, brother in 2010. They employ around 1,000 people, making such a huge impact uh, worldwide, and of course, even working with entrepreneurs on the continent. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining me this morning. I'm still standing because I want to ask you to visualize something for me, and you can even close your eyes if you want to indulge. You wake up in the morning, you're about 15 years old, in a small village in a remote area somewhere in the world, in any emerging market. You watch your mother work relentlessly seven days a week to feed you. You watch your father do the same, with one aim to give you an education. To get water means going to a communal tap, You've got intermittent electricity, very few resources at your disposal, but you have a spark inside you and you have a passion that ignites. And there's something inside you that tells you, I want to make my life better, I want to impact my parents' life, and I want to impact my village as well. And you ask yourself, how do I do this? How do I get myself out of the current situation with very little resources at my disposal? Government is working against me. I'm in a, a country where the political environment does not even think about me. The leaders don't think about me. But somehow I make it out. And now I'm in this room of 200 people. And I'm engaging with the greatest minds coming out of the continent. How do I make sure that I keep on remembering myself as a teenager, growing up with a spark and passion inside me, but with nothing at my disposal? How are you, ladies and gentlemen, going to continue to impact that young person that could impact an entire village, an entire country, through being in the private sector or the public sector. And I hope some of these stories that I've mentioned and some of these elements resonate with you. And I know a lot of you do come from very tough backgrounds. So how are we going to continue to do this? Very important. Africa is growing 3.8%. We've got a fantastic uh, move towards uh, African growth story but we haven't fulfilled all the industrial revolutions and now we're faced with the fourth industrial re re uh, revolution. Are we ready? And this is the question that we're going to be answering today. Mr. Dangote, I'm gonna start with the personal stories from everyone. <laughs> Growing up in Kano State, tell me about how you started out. I know you were a hustler from a very young age. In fact, all Nigerians are hustlers. <laughs> but, you know, how much of a hustler were you really? 
Uh, well, that's a long, uh, that's a long story. It's true. I've always, uh, you know, um, started hustling even when I was in uh, <laughs> primary school. I would go and buy some sweets, you know, out of my pocket money and start sort of really selling and uh, making them, some, uh, you know, selling? yeah, you know, selling, <laughs> making, uh, you know. So I've been testing money for a very long time. <laughs> But really, uh, you know, the story is that, uh, you know, we started off with trading in 1978. I started my own, you know, company, you know, uh, after school. And what I decided to do is not to go and work for the family, is to go and, you know, do it on my own. And I started with trading, you know, because majority of Nigerians then were actually in trading. Uh, industrialization wasn't really what people were thinking about, you know, because uh, of rampant government, uh, you know, switch in terms of change of policies, inconsistencies in policies. So it was really very difficult to do industry and also survive, you know, because of inconsistencies in terms of government policies and also lack of power, electricity, you know, was a problem. Uh, especially, you know, in Nigeria. So what we did, we traded for almost about 19 years, from 1978 to, uh, you know, 1996. 1996, at that time, you know, we contacted uh, a company called Arthur Anderson, which is now KPMG and Accenture, you know, when they used to. And what they did was, you know, we had two days of a retreat we wanted to find out, okay, fine, what really happened to the other entrepreneurs who doubled into industrialization? You know, how did they fail? Because we really didn't want to fail. And at that time, we had too much cash accumulated from the trading, you know, because within those uh, 18, 19 years of, I mean, 19 years of our own trading, we really, uh, you know, were lucky because most of the commodities, especially in Nigeria, we were sort of like number one. So we made substantial amount of money. And, uh, you know, we are not borrowing. We have never ever borrowed uh, money up to 2000 because we got into industrialization. And we went there very aggressively, you know, very aggressively in the sense that, okay, fine, you know, we want to make sure that we transform our own country from an import based country to a manufacturing, uh, you know, country, which means. Uh, you know, uh, backward integration. So what really came out of that our retreat with Arthur Anderson was that, yes, the, most of the interview, uh, entrepreneurs, they failed because of mainly two reasons. There are a couple of other reasons, but two. One was lack of power. One was, you know, inconsistencies in terms of government policies. So we decided that, okay, fine, you know, uh, one, we have an answer which is the power, the electricity we can generate on our own. What do we do with other ones? The only way you can do with people who are in power is to engage. Because if you don't engage them, you know, they can go and uh, do things that will actually harm your business. So we decided that, okay, fine, we will get close to government and just be advising that, look, this is what you should do, this is what you shouldn't do. This, you know, because it's a partnership. Did they listen to you? Uh, yes, in a way, you know, they do, but we have to be persistent. You know, you have and to... Especially I mean, in Nigeria, think, right? <laughs> <laughs> they do. <clears throat> they do. They, they listen, uh, but, you know, it's a tug of war. Okay. It's not really that easy. You know, it's not that easy. So, you know, um, let me quickly round up so that, you know, so we can understand and maybe it will help them to ask questions. So what happened was that now we move in, we started various industries, sugar, we did a sugar refinery, we did flour milling, we uh, did a cement terminal, and then later on now we decided that, okay, fine, look, uh, Nigeria was importing 80% of the cement that we're consuming. So maybe we need to really reverse it and make sure that we produce cement, you know, uh, you know in Nigeria. <clears throat> and we said that, okay, fine, you know, uh, how do we do that? Then the president said, that, okay, fine. Aliko, what can we do? I said, Mr. President, if we are going to continue to import, we'll be importing poverty, exporting jobs out. So if we will produce locally, you have to give some sort of incentives where you can only import if you are doing a backward integration. And that is the policy that Nigeria adopted 
for us to now have full self-sufficiency in cement. And now we look at the entire uh, sub-Saharan African continent. Majority of the countries that are importing cement. So we went very aggressive after meeting our own, uh, this in Nigeria, now we went uh, to 17 countries to try and make sure that we make the self-sufficiency in cement because Africa lacks infrastructure. So we went ahead, we uh, did uh, quite a lot. And if you look at countries like Zambia, Tanzania, wherever that we produce cement today, prices have gone down massively, drastically. You know, because before you it was... you can compete with imports at, that, at, at, at the level we're at at the moment? No, no, we can compete with anything. You know, because what we did uh, right from the beginning is to have the highest technology. We are the only cement manufacturers in Africa that are using robotics. So that's what you do, right from the mining. You see, because I know that the challenge was going to come from the, yes, okay, yes, this... Uh, guys, these Africans, they won't be able to produce a high quality, you know, cement. So the question is to do with quality and also with price. So, and that's what we did. Then now we look at, uh, okay, fine, what do we do? We've done cement. Why, I always tell people that, look, our company is very, very transformational. And we look at it, you look at what is happening now. The, in 2011 and 2012, Nigeria gave subsidy of $30 billion in, in uh, petroleum products. And we're still in the same mess. It's not only Nigeria, almost majority of African, uh, sub-Saharan African countries, they import their crude oil. So what we have done now is to go into, you know, building uh, 650,000 barrels refinery, which is the largest ever in the world. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because the biggest, largest ever is 500,000. Yeah. So, but we have now said that, no, we must set up a record, you know, because there's nothing that's impossible. We are doing that. And we are doing 3 million tons of fertilizer because Nigeria imports almost what we need. So we are doing that. We are doing uh, a gas pipeline, you know, two gas pipelines of 550 submersible, in, you know, from the sea. And, uh, you know, from the Niger Delta in Nigeria, to uh, Lagos and then taking it to, uh, you know, uh, uh, West Africa. And we're doing petrochemical of 1.3 million tons of polypropylene polyethylene. In this last, in these five years, we're actually spending $18 billion to transform our own industries, you know, to industrialize Nigeria and also to make sure that, yes, Nigeria now will end up becoming one of the largest uh, exporter of petroleum products in, uh, by 2020, from a major importer to now, you know, largest exporter. Uh, Nigeria now will be exporting more fertilizer than any African country on record. And that's supposed to start happening at the end of the year? Yes. The fertilizer that, production? That will start. And Incredible. Also the, uh, so there are quite a lot of transformational things that we are doing. And I think that what I keep saying, uh, we Africans are the only ones that will lead in to transform mean our continent. Uh, it's just going to be done by us. It's not going to be done by, uh, yes, we want to have foreign investment, but foreign investment will not do the job. We have to show confidence in our own continent and make sure that we build our own continent, not by other people. Mr. Manuel, private sector. Public sector, pardon me. We're in the private sector now as chairman of our region. Yes. A little bit, But tell me about the young Trevor in South Africa during the apartheid government, knowing that, you know, if you wanted to instill change, you'd have to be part of the struggle to fight against an oppressive government. What happened? There's a specific moment in time where you made a decision to get into that. Thank you very much, Lenny. I don't know what the organizers thought, but they put me, the poor boy, between these billionaires. <laughs> I don't think it's going to rub off, but... Uh... Well, you have been dealing with billions of dollars, actually, <laughs> mostly, but someone else's money, right? The, I mean, growing up in apartheid South Africa meant that um, injustice was in your face every single day. And very early in my life, uh, 
We grew up in a community that was very mixed. And uh, in 1961, just, just around the time that, apart, that uh, uh, South Africa became a republic, uh, many of our neighbors moved out. These government trucks came, moved out people. Mm -hmm. Our school, I started school very early in life, uh, our school was empty. Uh, we didn't have to double shift any longer. Uh, and, and the questions that, that, that were raised in the house were about what was happening to the country and the neighborhood. And I grew up through school. And I was fortunate because it was a time that, was, that saw a lot of militants around the continent, certainly. Um, the struggles for the decolonization of Africa were still very, very ripe. Mm. I mean, so, you know, as a young teenager, I, I, I grew up with understanding the words of Kwame Nkrumah, give me first the keys to the political kingdom. What does politics mean and how does that impact on the lives of people? And then uh, I was at school still when uh, uh, SASO, uh, the South African Students' Organization, was built. Steve Biko became a feature. Um, and uh, there was a walkout, and my friends at the University of the Western Cape walked off campus. Uh, and in the community, we, we tried to absorb this. Uh, soon out of school, uh, uh, a, a different injustice, a bus fare increase, saw us trying to mobilize communities against this. Um, and when we wiped out our eyes, it was 1976. Mm -hmm. The Soweto uprising, and it wasn't confined to Soweto ever. I mean, soon after Soweto, um, there was a young guy, Christopher Truto, who was shot not far from where, where I lived in a place called Bontiavulon Flats. Um, last night, three people were shot in Bontiavulon, but this was very different. This was uh, a bit like Hector Peterson. This was a young schoolboy who was shot in one of the early protests in Bontiavulon. And from there... I think it became necessary to ensure that communities understood what was happening. Mm. Through the 70s, uh, it was building community organizations, building worker organizations, and trying to integrate these. By 1980, there was a, a fresh school boycott uh, that coincided with the boycott of red meat because of how workers were treated but in Samantha, the abattoir. Just, just to interject that you were also incarcerated over that time, right? In the my, my incarceration the happens a little bit later. Um, through the period, I, 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 I studied civil engineering. Um, so the stuff that Aliko talks about uh, on, on, on uh, cement and so on, I, I understand. I internalize it. It's part of my DNA. Um, but by 1981, I was faced with a contradiction. I either continued to work in industry or I became a full-time activist. I became the activist. By 1983, we started a huge movement in this country called the United Democratic Front. Uh, I was young. I was, I was all of 27 years old. Uh, on the national executive, we convened and convened a movement across the length and breadth of the country in the face of the worst kind of oppression and repression by the apartheid regime. And we knew. We knew the... the, the it was, it was either that you were going to be convicted and end up on Robben Island or in some other prison for a long time, or detention, and sometimes we lost many close friends and comrades. Mm -hmm. uh, people were gunned down. I mean, you know, the Craddock 4, the uh, disappearance of the Pepco 3. But we found ways to organize and give voice to people. In, in my life, I've done all kinds of things. I've, I've, I've been involved in adult literacy. I've been involved on the margins of trade unionism. Uh, I worked as a community uh, organizer in civic organizations. And then all of that sort of, uh, the confluence of all of that was a political movement, which by the late 80s became completely unstoppable. I was detained for, um, in fact, between... Uh, uh, 1985 and, and, and February the 2nd, 1990, when the ANC was unbanned, uh, I was detained uh, or house arrested for all but about two months. Um, but all of that, all of that, I think, strengthened us. We, 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 we understood what 
the task of liberation was. It wasn't ever about us. I mean, there was no point in that period when I, as Trevor Manuel, or many of the other people I, 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 I was involved with, would see ourselves in government later. It was about developing a skill set, I think, that assisted us. And so, 1990, 2nd of February, the ANC is unbanned. 11th of February, Nelson Mandela is released. We are there. Uh, I, I have the privilege of traveling through Africa with him on his first visit after his release. Um, we, we build this organization with Nelson Mandela at its helm. Uh, 1994, come democracy. I'm not quite prepared, but you know, I, I become Minister of Trade and Industry and then Minister of Finance. And there is nowhere in my CV that you will find an economics degree. Were you criticized for that? There were some people who, who criticized me. I have a different view of life. I have a different view of learning, and I think we learn. And a lot of learning is attitudinal. A lot of learning is attitudinal. It's sharing. And I don't, I've, met, I've met people, colleagues, uh, ministers everywhere, uh, uh, big PhDs from big universities, but no sense of what it's about. And I think if we, we ever had the view that life is only about a few macroeconomic simulations, uh, those long pages of equations, then I think we're wrong. The measure of what we do is in the lives of people, and if we fail to understand that, we fail to understand life. Thank you. John from Ireland, small hamlets in Ireland, growing up, if I'm not mistaken, in a rural kind of environment, and then learning to code, and with seven lines of code, I know I'm oversimplifying this, <laughs> seven <laughs> lines of code, and then boom, multi-billion dollar company, impacting people so significantly. How, I mean, how did that come about, with you and your brother kind of coming up and saying, well, we, we need to do this? Was there, again, a specific moment in time where you made that decision? I know you had quite a bit of competition between the two of you, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, your brother, so there's always well. uh, something going on there. Um, I, I think there were a few factors <coughs> at play for us that were, uh, of course, you don't really understand this as it's going on at the time, right? You're, you're just, your head's down at the time. Uh, we've been working on Stripe now for, since 2009, so for, for, for going on nine years. Um, and as I look back on it, there's maybe a, a few factors that I would pull out. Um, the first is self-belief, and I guess I think it was pretty helpful that we were young at the time. Uh, I think that's a general pattern you'll see, uh, that uh, the places that change comes from, can, you know, is often the youth. Change doesn't always have a well-polished resume. Mr. Emanuel did not have a, an economics degree. Um, I, I remember when we were actually trying to uh, get visas for the United States, because we were college dropouts, being a skilled immigrant who's a college dropout, it just like doesn't compute for the immigration authorities. You'd have it? a lot of trouble now if you had to do that, actually. Say again? You'd have, to, you'd have a lot more trouble doing that right now. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but, but so, so, so coming at it and being young enough to, to have that almost irrational degree of self-belief, I think that's actually required to get you through all the hurdles that you're going to run into. And so in our case... Uh, we didn't know anything about the industry that we were, we were entering. I mean, we were 19 and 21 when we started it. But then if you actually zoom out and look at the fact patterns, again, that's, that's sort of par for the course. Uh, Einstein was 26 when he published his famous uh, paper on special relativity and you know, blew open the existing uh, science establishment. Um, Ms. Kenowendo is 31 uh, and raising the bar for, for African politics. And so uh, one thing that gets me really excited is the kind of the, the youth and the energy in this room, because I think that's fairly frequently where, where this stuff comes from. I think it was, a, it was a big part of Stripe, the fact that we were coming from outside the existing establishment and not uh, within it. Um, that's one. That kind of leads to the second thing, which is uh, education. Um, us being able to... Uh, and I say education, not schooling fairly deliberately. A lot of the best people I know are lifetime learners and are just voraciously sucking up knowledge from, from wherever they can get it, really. Uh, and in our case, there was, um, you know, we're very fortunate the public school system in, in Ireland is very good. Uh, 
But also, again, you're trying to uh, pick up knowledge wherever you can get it. And so we, uh, you know, we learned to code from, our parents bought us, uh, you know, various books on programming, and I remember typing things into the computer that you were copying from the book uh, as, as, as part of how you're getting going. And one thing that gets me really excited is the kinds of different things uh, that are possible now thanks to the scalability of the internet. A again, schooling is one thing, but education is another. And you know, we, saw, um, we saw the video of Linda from Akira Where's Linda, is she? Um, she's here in the audience somewhere. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I love how many of the fellows are, uh, are focused on education um, because, you know, g going back to your story of the, uh, you know, the, the person growing up in the village, that is one of the biggest things that we can do, and that was a huge part of where we got to. Um, and the last thing that maybe I feel is a big part of our story was mobility, and that, as you say, you know, we grew up in a, a very small part of, um, or a very rural part of uh, Ireland, a small village there. I ended up moving to the United States for college, ended up moving out to San Francisco uh, from there. Uh, when I was growing up in Ireland, uh, Ireland was benefiting a lot from membership of the European Union. Uh, and you know, mobility is a big part of uh, that project and, and how the European Union self-defines. You know, they talk about these four freedoms, uh, the movement of people, goods, services, and capital. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, you know, as we look across the African continent, I think that's an interesting question for us to, to reckon with because, you know, I think the European Union and other places are much, as unions of countries, are, are much further ahead there. You were talking about the difficulty of getting, you know, a Nigerian visa, yeah. uh, and that seems like a fairly common problem. Uh, but and things so, are changing for, for Europe as well now with Brexit. Is that, is that a worry, do you well, think? Well, it's certainly that... changing for Britain, no. um, <laughs> but... <laughs> I mean, look, Europe, I think, is still, you know, world leading when it comes to how closely all those kind of separate countries, uh, separate countries integrate. Uh, and that is something that was a huge part of what allowed us to do Stripe, um, that mobility. Uh, and I think will be a big part of, you know, anyone who wants to do something going forward, it'll be important for them. Again, the good news is that I think there's a certain kind of mobility you get from you as a person being able to move around. There's another story of mobility, which is just digital mobility enabled by uh, the fact that you have your physical geographic place, but then you, have, you, know, you get to be part of an internet community as well. And more and more, we're seeing people doing digital first initiatives digital first communities, you all in a Slack group, you know, even when you go your separate ways and you're not physically here. And I think we haven't seen the limits of what's possible with that. And it's certainly something that we are trying to push the boundaries of with Stripe. So, you know, there's a bunch of companies here at the Stripe Atlas program where they're running, you know, US companies, no matter where in the world they are based. Um, and that was definitely a big part of what allowed us to get where we are. And it's something I want to stay pushing the boundaries on. Okay, so we've got a fantastic, um, you know, diversity on this panel. I think, Mr. Dangote, you're in more of the traditional sectors. I know you're saying you're into robotics now, but in the room of 200, <laughs> well, I mean, on the cement we'll front, right? Robotics. You use robotics. You can elaborate on that in a moment. <laughs> but, I mean, in a room of 200 aspiring leaders, entrepreneurs, would you advise to get into the more traditional sectors? I mean, cement, sugar, flour, I mean, the, the stuff that you've been involved in, more in, you know, the, industri the notion of industrialization. Or would you be looking further ahead and getting more into tech? And I say this in the light of the fact that we still need to build roads. We don't have manufacturing capacity. Um, there are so many, I mean, you know the issues on the ground, and a lot of people here as well do. Do you think it's a combination of both we need to be looking at, or do we need to no, plunge ourselves into fourth industrial revolution? I think, you know, things have changed, uh, you know, elsewhere, but I think for Africa, we need to look at both. Both the technology, because that's really what's going on right now, and also the basic industries. Because the issue is that in Africa, we import a lot. We actually don't produce much. So we need to make sure that these are raw materials that we keep exporting. We will add value, create jobs, and do that. So in Africa, really, we need to concentrate more on, uh, you know, industrialization, uh, infrastructure, agriculture, and then the tech, high tech. What's fascinating is, and I think you alluded to this earlier, with the cement industry, um, 
tariffs on cement products, on imports, assisted the local industry to grow, to grow and essentially your, your company to grow as well. Should we be imposing more tariffs on imports, on agricultural products? Should we be looking at becoming more protectionist to grow our local industries? I mean, it's a big conversation well, globally, but we're trying to inc uh, you know, get borders open between African countries. What, what is the best formula? Well, I think the best formula for us, first of all, is to make sure that, yes, we produce what we consume, rather than allowing people to be dumping on our continent where they stop us. Uh, they, they actually stop us from you know, uh, creating jobs. Uh, if you look at the African continent, on average, we have about 65% of the population below the age of 35. So definitely, you know, they cannot keep holding on. You have to create jobs for them. If you have to create jobs for them, then you need to look at all these things. Okay, fine, what do they do? Yes, it's true. Uh, I like the story of, like, India. You know, in 1993, 1994, India had only reserves of one week foreign exchange results of one week. But today, it's a totally a different, uh, you know, country, okay? Because today, India has even overtaken France as the number six economy in the world. But look at where they were. So in Africa, too, we need to really make sure that, yes, we protect our industries. You see, because I'm not saying that, yes, you should, uh, yes, you have to protect our own industries. I mean, you look at what uh, President Trump is doing right now. Not that I agree with what he's doing, because uh, they are in a totally a different uh, world. They're in the first world, we are in the second world, right? So if you look at it today, uh, you now say, okay, fine, yes, let's allow all these uh, you know, goods to come in, no protection. Then you are not going to end up having any industry. But if you protect, when you develop your own uh, uh, industries, your own people that they can compete with anybody, then you can open up the uh, market, let everybody come in and con you know, uh, compete. But right now we don't have, so when we're building, what these guys will do is to try now and come in and dump goods into our market. And let me give you a typical example. I even said it yesterday when we had a meeting with the president, I said that well, we have to look at how we can protect our industries. For example, uh, you know, today if you are traveling, right, you know, in British Airways, let me give you an example of their business class. They have three types. There is a business class, there is a J uh, class, there is club class. And each of these, they have different prices. Even in first class, you have A class, you have uh, first class. A class is 30% cheaper. So. Our own sort of industries, any industry, okay, you know, the price that you are talking about, why you cover your cost, your profit, is the first maybe 60 seats, if you have 100 seats. The 40 seats, you can go and dump it and sell at 50% below cost. I mean, 50% be, uh, below the first cost. Okay, let's say now you are buying uh, business, uh, first class. First class might be $10,000 normally from Lagos to London and back. But if you are buying A class, it's going to be about like 7,000. Okay, so that 7,000 is one that other countries will be coming into our own uh, continent and be dumping their goods, where it will never ever allow us to compete, not even talk about building our own industries. If we were to compete uh, at a global level, that means government needs to buy in, that we're talking about tariffs, we're talking about policy. But in the current situation, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are just trying to make do with what they have. Am I right? Is that what you guys are trying to do? Yeah. So how, how do you make it happen? I mean, Mr. Manuel, do you want to jump in here? Look, I, I, whatever else happens, I, I think that we need competent administration. You need, you need smart people who are entrepreneurial, and sitting in governments and doing the things that make sense. The, the, the big idea of building high walls behind which you can do anything doesn't help the population either. And I'll, I'll give you an example of South Africa. When I became Minister of Trade and Industry, um, the tariff on automobiles was 125%. Now, if you have protection of 125%, you can get away with anything. Consumers don't have a choice. 
Um, productivity doesn't actually matter. Price doesn't matter. You can get away with anything. And the people who suffer are actually the poor in countries. And if it happens not just with big industrial products, but also with food and so on, then, then the poor will actually suffer. Whatever is said about current administration in the U.S., if they impose those big tariff walls, I guarantee you in the Midwest of the United States, the poor who happen to be more dependent on imports from China are going to be the people who suffer most. You need governments that are as smart as, 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 as the stuff we talk about. It's ensuring that, that you have agility even in government and tariffs and so on. And that is something that must be understood. And if you want that, then part of what we must encourage young people to do is to recognize that if you don't have smart governments, then we continually leave the poor behind. We cut people off from opportunities and we continue with the traditions that still exist in Africa. On the continent, there are many people who do exceedingly well but there are too many people who are trapped in poverty. We have a distinct and elite group of young people here with us. But many multiples of this number die in the Mediterranean every year trying to get off the continent. That is the measure of the tragedy of not creating a program of transformation on, on the continent. That is our responsibility. It's their responsibility. In the way that President Obama spoke yesterday of, of handing this over, Madiba spoke of it's in your hands. And I think that message is a fundamentally important message. And so the ability to analyze what is not in place and to drive change is part of the transformation challenge that I think affects the younger generation. Andrew sitting over here the other day, we, he and I were together uh, uh, on the Cape Flats we thought we were going to talk to about maybe 100 young unemployed people. 6,000 people pitched up. We had to ask the mayor to open a stadium to talk to those people. <laughs> this is the challenge of unresolved expectations of people. And if we don't understand this as a collective responsibility, I think we fail to understand what the challenge of transformation on the continent is all about. We've got around 20 minutes left, so if I could just get short, sharp answers from my panelists, and then we're going to open the floor to questions as well, so you can get those thoughts ready. Mrs. Angotta, did you want to jump in here? I know you've got differing views on protection, on tariffs. Um, did you want to no, no, comment well, on I mean, that? Yeah, well, you know, my, my own, you know, I uh, agree with what, uh, you know, Trevor said. But you see, the biggest challenge that we have is that they are more talented. I mean, I, uh, I pray and I hope some of the uh, 200, uh, you know, some of these 200, uh, you know, African imagine, uh, you know, leaders will go into government. Because really in government, there is no capacity at all. You know, we, we, can, we can only make Africa great if we have some of our best people in the government side. Okay, because in the private side, yes, people do take, you have uh, quite a lot, almost, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, we have quite a lot of entrepreneurs. Everybody, you know, people, a lot of people, especially like what you said from Nigeria, they're actually entrepreneurs by birth. You know, so, <laughs> you know, they're entrepreneurs by birth. So I think it is good for us to make sure that, yes, we also have that high quality of, you know, people in, uh, you know, government. But you see, it's true, uh, uh, you see, it depends on what model, uh, Trevor, you're talking about. Because if you look at the model of uh, India, it, it, it really, it works. Because the model of India, yes, it's true, they build the, you know, this thing. I don't believe that U.S. should go and put up tariffs. But in Africa, if we don't really put tariffs, we'll end up being the dumping ground of the entire world. I'm not saying don't put up tariffs. I'm saying be smart about it. Okay, yeah, be smart about it. But that's why I'm... And, and, and frequently, you see, and you need a rules-based system. And the problem that big countries are now, are now driving towards is the collapse of multilaterals. The World Trade Organization needs to be a smart rules-based system. If they can't deliver rules that apply, then you will have dumping. 
Yeah, but that definitely. But then those countries is if they have institutions, and that's what we lack in Africa. Okay, I want to bring in John. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one lens for this is, so economists talk about these models for the economy and yeah. in different modes of economic developments, and you have the primary, secondary, and tertiary economy. Primary is resource extraction, mining, agriculture, things like this. Secondary is uh, doing things with those resources, manufacturing and stuff like that. And then the tertiary economy is services. And now, as we're moving more and more away from economies that are dependent on kind of uh, uh, primary uh, uh, kind of resource extraction, people are even talking about the fourth, the fourth wave here being uh, the quaternary economy of intellectual capital and research, high tech, academia, uh, and, and things like that. Uh, and one thing to note is that you can talk about and think about tariffs in the primary and secondary economy. And honestly, one of the reasons that the, I mean, the current US tariffs are a bit silly is that I mean, the, the U.S. has moved so far beyond being a, an economy dependent on that, that primary sector of the economy. But as you move into these third and fourth waves and you're in the, the world of intellectual capital, these markets are global. These ideas are global. And I think you're shooting yourself in the foot if you as an entrepreneur or you as a country are setting your sights faced you know, to inwards. Uh, and so I, I think a lot of the entrepreneurs in this room are increasingly thinking about the global markets for their ideas. You know, we have the founder of um, Sync Commerce here, uh, a, a startup uh, based in Ghana, and 70% uh, of their sales are in the United States, uh, and that's an increasingly common model. Uh, and by the way, your competition is global, and so even if you don't want to be global, I mean, you tough. Can, you didn't You're, play you, the, exactly. The, the top league, right? You, you didn't get to choose that, and so I think we can talk about these kinds of questions in more of the primary and secondary world, but as we, you know, a lot of people uh, in this room are in the world of intellectual capital uh, and the intellectual economy, and I think that's a, di a different playing field. Okay, Silicon Valley. We're trying to emulate models of Silicon Valley on the continent, whether it's Silicon Cape or when you see, you know, hubs uh, emerging in Kenya and Nigeria and other countries um, around the continent. Do you think that is the right model? Because you're, you're in Silicon Valley at the moment. Is that the right thing to do? Do we have to create these hubs? Oh, yeah. I think that's a great idea. Um, it is increasingly evident that you do not need to be in Silicon Valley to create a large, successful technology company. And, you know, if, if someone was to disagree with you on that fact, that they have to face an accumulating set of data points around the world of people building really exciting technology success stories. And again, one of the things in this world of uh, any kind of high-tech pursuit is it's very dependent on the people. And so one of the things that makes Silicon Valley tick is the fact that you have so many you know, highly qualified people with interesting ideas just all you know, running around, bumping into each other, and you get these network effects. I think starting to create these network effects in hubs, and you're already starting to see these you know, effects where you're getting tech hubs emerging in Cape Town, in Lagos, in Nairobi, in places like that. Uh, I think that's a big part of the, the recipe. For Do you success. think an African tech company can be the next big thing globally? Are you seeing signs of that through the, the, the companies that are on your platform? I don't see why not. Yeah. 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 I hope that some of you in the they room. Think so. <laughs> Okay, I want to shift gears a little and just talk about you know, the current situation in South Africa. And I think it's important because we forget about how the political uh, scenario that in, in whatever country we operate in, we live in, does influence what we do and our success a lot of the time. Cyril Amaposa talks about South Africa being open for business and the new dawn. Credit rating agencies, however, are very worried about this notion of land redistribution without compensation. Mr. Manuel, you were talking about the Group Areas Act uh, a little earlier and you saw the devastation. How do you ensure that people, that, that the ills of the past are worked on without jeopardizing the investment prognosis for, for a country? And I think there's so many examples uh, of people that operate across the continents in this room that have that perhaps face a, sa a similar thing. Well, one of the things that I have to do for my sins is uh, be an investment envoy for President Ramaphosa. So we go out and talk to people, and the issue of land comes up frequently. Um, and, and part of it, I think, is, is, is an unresolved matter. Uh, President Ramaphosa said the other day on television that w when, when the Constitution was drafted, 
there were a couple of issues that, that appeared intractable at first. One of them was language. Um, another uh, was the land issue. Um, and we, we, we crafted into our constitution in the Bill of Rights, Section 25, that deals with property rights. So you recognize the right to property, but you also recognize within that clause that some of the property that people have accumulated in South Africa were by means not fair. Yeah. And so there are, there are and, and the Constitution required of us to draft a piece of legislation to create an instrument that would allow for judicial oversight. Now, we failed to actually produce the legislation required by the Constitution. And you've had this pent-up feeling. The issue of land is actually complex because on the one hand there's agricultural land. And the President said yesterday as well that the issues of land are so important because land, uh, uh, agricultural land must provide for food security, must provide for inclusion, must provide for the functioning of food markets, all of those things are there. Yet parts of it have been poorly dealt with. And there's this pent-up demand for agricultural land. But the bigger challenge in South Africa is actually in urban land. And you, you couldn't come to ALA here and not drive past very large informal settlements. And this is happening because the responsibility of the state, and again, uh, there's a clause 26 in our, in our uh, section 26 in our constitution, that requires the state to provide access to adequate housing. It hasn't been dealt with. And so in the process of, of, of inward migration and urbanization, people basically just set up where they can. And many of the battles are actually about urban land. There's a proposal now, uh, and it's, it's underway as we speak, for a, a, a committee of parliament to go throughout the country and to listen to voices. You can't stop it now. You've got to take those voices and then bring them all together, draw on a variety of experiences. John, even the Irish experience of land, because your colonial masters, the English, had confiscated land, and the Irish waged a big struggle to get land back. All of those become important in factoring in a set of proposals that are rational and orderly and inclusive in the land issue going forward. Communicating this, I think, is a bigger challenge than what we, 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 we thought uh, we would have to undertake, but it's something we have to talk through. We can't be crazy, we can't be anarchic about the land issues. It has to be order, orderly, and you must have outside agency, such as uh, the judiciary, having a look into what is happening. I want to give you an opportunity to ask questions. I'm sure you've got t loads of them. Um, oh dear, we've got like 10 minutes left. Okay. Uh, <laughs> where's the closest microphone, please? Uh, who's got a mic? Who's actually got a mic with them? He's got a voice. Yes, okay, please come, come forward, gentleman with the mic. There's a gentleman here that I cannot say no to. He's <laughs> right in front here. Please, short, sharp, introduce yourself. I need you to be as quick as possible. Thank you, thank you thank very you. much. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm a commissioner with Anambra State Government. And my question is for my mentor and inspiration, uh, Chairman Alaji Dangote. Um, sir, I do agree with your position that we need to get young people, in, young, prepared, smart people into government. Um, that's the only way we can turn it around. We've done that in Anambra and it's working. Um, so my, myself and other young people in government, we started, we started an initiative to inspire, to empower, and to prepare young Nigerians for roles in government. And I was just wondering if it's something that you would love to support, because we're trying to reach out to you, sir. Thank you. Is this an investor roadshow? This is like an investor roadshow, right? Short, sharp, shorter than that, please, the uh, lady over there. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> this is for um, our leader, Mr. Alaji Dangote. Oh my um, he already asked what I want to ask, but one thing, one thing. You mentioned you are going to be using robotics for your industry. So I want to know if 
you think to the future where you can support robotics education in Africa so that we start getting young people ready for that industry. Thank you very much. Um, let's go on this side. Um, the gentleman over there, the glasses over here, right next to you. Yeah, there we go. My name is Gamario Mboya from Tanzania, and my question also goes to Dangote. I understand that he has been doing investment in many countries, and perhaps in one way or another he gets barriers due to foreign investment. So because he said that Africa will be built by African, now I'm asking him uh, from his experience, what is his call? on Africa investment, meaning can, uh, poli uh, investment policies, uh, uh, policies, how should they be in order to favor Africans to invest in African countries? Thank you very much. I'm gonna take one from the front and then we'll go to answers. There you go, this lady over here, perhaps. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Pamela Adi. I am an LGBT rights activist from Nigeria. And my question is to Alaji Dangote. Alaji, your foundation's main goal is lifting people out of poverty. And we know that structural dis um, discrimination increases poverty because it reduces access. My question is, would you be willing to support the work of nonprofit organizations that work to stop discrimination of sexual minorities in Nigeria? Thank you. Okay, we're going to um, take another round of questions right after this. Mr. Dangose, I know you have a lot of questions to answer. If I could ask you to be okay. as brief as possible, only because we would like to get more questions in. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Can I start? Yes, please. All right, thank you very much. I think the first question was, you know, about supporting uh, young leaders uh, into government. Yes, well, you know, we are not only ready to support, we are already supporting. If you look at it now, we have a program with the World Economic Forum, and uh, we already have more than 90 uh, young global leaders, which we are actually paying very, very dearly. You know, each one is costing us more than $70,000, you know, to support. Well, because when we look at the program, they have very, very few Africans, and we have opened up that to, you know, uh, you know, Africans. I think any organization, you know, that, uh, you know, will come and uh, inject young, energetic, committed leaders into government will be able to support that. Our foundation will do that, definitely. And... Uh, you can, you can, you know, you can ask you have, you know, listen to, write to us. It also really bothers us that really we don't have good capacity in government. So we'll do that. We'll, uh, we'll be able to do that. You can write to us. Thank you. And then support of robotic industry. Uh, well, what we are doing right now is that because we are trying to create something, you know, uh, in Nigeria right now we have already. Uh, we have what you call uh, Dongote Academy, and we're actually transforming that from the academy now into a university, a technical university. We have already commissioned, uh, you know, a law firm, you know, to work on that, and I'm sure within, uh, by next year, by early next year, we'll start building our own Dongote Technical University, so that will actually, you know, we'll be able to teach, we'll be able to, you know, at least to change the curriculum, well, now, for example, any time when we go out there to hire people, we have to retrain them, and we really don't want that. We want to, you know, have people who will go to universities, and when they come out, they already have a job. You know, you can be an entrepreneur, you can learn uh, whether it's music or whatever, so you have something that, uh, you know, you can do the next day when you leave uh, this, and that will help quite a lot. The other one is about uh, favoring African investments. You cannot go in a country and do only uh, this. Yes, I know that in uh, South Africa they have a BE. I think, I don't really think if it is okay to now just, you know, carve out something and say that this is just for Africans. All what you need to do is to make sure that you have good investment policies. If you have good investment policies, people will go and invest. The only thing is that, yes, Africans have to drive that process, and then they will now let her be joined by, you know, there's no foreigner that will come to your country and just put in his money. 
it's not possible. And I think it's, it's a bit risky even if he tries to do that. It's always better you take a local with you and make sure that you work together. But what I always encourage our own uh, various African countries is try and have a very strong uh, banking institution so that, yes, they'll be able to support the locals for them to make, uh, you know, to uh, access credit because accessing credit is very, very difficult. So when you have foreign banks dominating your economy, it is always very difficult for your own, uh, you know, this thing to, uh, you know, to uh, uh, succeed, for your locals to succeed and be able to have a proper inclusive growth in the economy. Fantastic. There was one last question, though. Um, it was the lady in front okay, of the Okay, the lady, uh, we, well, you know, our foundation has specific things that we support. And we really don't go out those specific things, you know, which is education, empowerment, uh, health, and disaster relief. Uh, in Africa, you know, there are quite a lot of uh, demands here and there, you know, which, you know, so when we did the uh, endowment, uh, additional endowment for the foundation, about $1.25 billion, we restricted ourselves to this. Even this ones, you know, there are major, major challenge uh, that we're facing today. Thank you very much. Okay, does anyone have questions for Mr. Manuel and for John? Thank you. Who? Who's? Just so we can we can even it out. <laughs> okay, this gentleman in front here, please. Thank you. We've got a mic. Okay. Welcome, Manuel. Since we last met in Dar es Salaam in 2016. Short and sharp, please. Hey, please, quick, quick, quick. My question goes like this: As you have stated, Africans, African youth are risking their lives to cross the Mediterranean seas to look for a better opportunity in Europe. My question is, how do we truly decide our economics to promote good governance, then how do we improve the quality of growth to create jobs? Thank you very much. One and for the John. Ta- the last one. No, uh, the, uh, oh, the last, I'm the last. I'm running out of time. I'm, I'm running. One for John. John, the lady in front here. Thank you. Hi, John. How are you? My name is Yadam from The Gambia. I recently just relocated back from um, Washington, D.C., and I've noticed that a lot of um, applications, social business applications, are not inclusive of our continent, specifically for yours, Stripe. While we set it up in the U.S., we are able to sell our books online, but in being in Gambia, it is not accessible to us. Um, Same goes for YouTube, PayPal, and Venmo. So why is it that we are not inclusive in that process, and is that something you guys are considering changing? Thank you. Fantastic. John, start with you. Sure. Um, So two things. One is we're actually working to to some extent on the continent already, uh, and so we support now going on thousands of entrepreneurs uh, across across the continent through our Stripe Atlas program. But we're not, you know, here on the ground. We don't have operations in the continent. Uh, And I mean, the the short version of, of why that is is because to get it right, it's you know, it's pretty damn complex. Uh, and so we've been gradually, if you look at what Stripe is doing, rolling out country by country. Payments is very cultural, very contextual, very nuanced. And honestly, the last thing, I think one thing that's somewhat helpful in our experience is the fact that you know, a lot of Stripe are immigrants to you know, the United States and we have a relatively global perspective. The last thing that we want to do is be the swaggering American company that comes along with an American-made solution that isn't actually tailored for what people on the continent need at all. Um, and kind of roll that out. And so as we look at supporting businesses, we know that it's going to be, you know, one set of things that are needed for businesses in Kenya with Mpeza and then another, you know, in South Africa with ETFs and everything like this. We, we get that it's going to be different. And that's a very long-term project for us. And so we're already doing some stuff. We would like to be doing much more than we are today, and we will get there, but it's a gradual process. I, I just wanted to respond briefly. I don't think that that you will get growing economies where you have poor governance. And and go back and and, and get the YouTube clip of President Obama's lecture yesterday. That's the essence of what he's talking about. You can't build sound economic policy and you're not going to get investment if you've got hyperinflation. If government is spending more on debt than what they are on services, it's not going to work. Government must focus on developing services in order to develop people. The good governance package is a big package. And I think as you deal with those kinds of issues, you create an environment 
that's a lot more attractive to investment that creates employment. I'm sure that, that Mr. Nangwati is not going to go into a country where if he puts in a billion dollars and it's depreciated the day it goes in, he's not going to go there. It's as basic as that. So you can forget about jobs unless you've got governance. And governance needs to be something that is accountable. So not everybody needs to go into government. We'd like to attract as many people as possible into it. But if government is accountable, then even people outside of government insist that the systems that they require are actually delivered by a government that recognizes their responsibility. It's also one of the themes covered in yesterday's lecture. All right. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We've totally run out of time. I'm going to do one quick, <laughs> no, I'm going to do one quick, just final wrap for my, for my guests. It's a one quick question. It's a yes or no answer. Is Africa the right place to be right now? Of course. To, to grow, to, to start a business. Yes. Of course. Yeah. Africa is this. It is the only place, even if you look at uh, the future, Africa has a better future than any continent. Fantastic. <laughs> Mr. Manuel, is that a yes? Africa is young and bold. We are, we are from the wrong side of the age curve, but Africa <laughs> is young and bold. Everywhere else in the world is going to be boring. We have to make this the only place in the world. John, you need to officially launch in Africa. Are we going to hold you to task on this? Are you going to do it? Well, oh, I mean, we will launch in Africa. That's a no-brainer. But yeah. I, I think your question is the wrong question. I think it's... Uh, is uh, Africa 10 years from now uh, the place to be? And that's a little bit up to us. Very true. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Aliko Dangote, Trevor Manuel, John Patterson. Thank you so much.